Hey everybody, welcome to this special jewel case event. Today we have Alex Livingston here to present his amazing battery show presentation. Um, hold on to your seats. This is going to be about a 30 minute video, but it's one that you've all been waiting for. How are you doing today, Alex? Great, Travis, good to see you. It's a pleasure to see you again. So you've been on the road a bit. I'd love to hear kind of how things go. And I believe you were just back from the battery show and then heading out to a next adventure. Um, what's going on with that and how did everything go and, and what's the plan for the rest of the week? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So last week I was in Detroit for the battery show, pushes up, uh, pushes up classes, very nerdy event, but very, very well attended this year. All of the topics were, were very focused on electric vehicles and how we solve a huge set of problems like rapid charging. What do we do with our poor grid infrastructure? How do we bring charging to uh, apartments, smaller, smaller residents, things like that. So it was, it was a very fantastic show. Dave was also there in attendance and spoke on a panel as well. And I gave the wrap up presentation that summarized where we are as the state of the industry and what jewel case actually brings to solving some of these big problems that there wasn't an answer to. It's fantastic. And you know, you're killing it. And what's really impressive is the whole jewel case team is out on the road right now on some major initiatives. You know, we just announced to the WeFunder group and all the investors, some of the success uh, partnering up with Insane Impact and the press release with the mobile portable um, uh, LCD screens. We showed the new unit on stage. Justin Leverier put on a, you know, did a little demo. Um, you're all out at the battery show and then heading out together the rest of the week. So it's got to feel good. Um, we also teased but did not reveal the big food truck order as well. So um, I know congratulations again on that massive order. I know you've been working on that for a bit, but uh, I was excited to see that come through just yesterday. So uh, it's got to feel good, Alex. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sitting talking to you right now in Pittsburgh. I'm, I'm at the airport and there's a huge Department of Energy invite only conference that's going on. And so that invite only conference is from the loan office program. And that's how all of the companies that are going to be solving these electric vehicle issues and challenges get access to some of the funding that's available. So it'll be a two day conference starting Thursday and Friday. So I'm here for that and speaking to you all now. It's fantastic. And, and just to warm it up a little bit, can you, uh, what is the presentation you're going to be showing now? So in particular, this takes a piece of technology that we developed, the modular energy storage system and how it applies to gas stations. So if you think about the gas station model, what are they going to do? Right. If there's no more gas that's needed in vehicles, especially in California, that's going to be banning the sale of, of gas vehicles in just 10 years. What's that business going to be like? So we're proposing a solution that doesn't shake up and change too much the consumer experience, doesn't mean that we have to have massive infrastructure changes, and we can deliver that immediately to the grid very, very quickly. So that was the presentation, and I'm looking forward to giving it to you now. Well, let's, um, let's turn it back to you and uh, go ahead and bring that presentation up, and we'll kick things off. A patented way to electrify gas stations. This harkens back to a day when uh, James and I didn't have quite so many gray hairs, um, but explaining that we've been in the battery space since 2006. So James and I originally came up with a concept for a modular exchangeable battery system, but that system required that a vehicle have all of these modules that were removable. In that case, it was one or two for a scooter or a moped. You could get up to maybe six for a smaller sedan and then multiples of those to drive range. And that's really important to understand where James and I had our foundation of getting into advanced battery systems. So um, take this with probably even a Polaroid, Travis. I'm gonna be honest, this, was, this is, feels like quite a long time ago. Um, but we were able to dig this up for the presentation. So understanding where our background was and also helping to understand and explain to, in this case, the battery show attendees, which were all of the major automotive manufacturers, as well as um, construction site equipment manufacturers like Caterpillar, John Deere, all of these groups were there. So giving a foundation of what our understanding was of electric vehicle drive systems, as well as range extension batteries. So you can see in the picture here, we have uh, the, the company that James and I first started in 2006, and we have all of these modular blades. 
it required a certain number of those blades to get up to voltage to drive a vehicle and then multiples of those to be able to to drive it for a longer for a longer distance and period of time we ended up getting a contract with the spanish government and i'll talk a little bit more about that but really what i want to start describing is our scalable battery systems so at that point in time everything had to rack into what was called a bus so a DC bus was a predetermined, pre-designed system. What we've done at Jewel Case and the patents that are around that is a stackable, expandable system with a bus that's integrated. So you don't need to have a fixed set of infrastructure. The infrastructure is the system that we've already designed. And that's really important for being able to think about what you can do with this as a fuel system. It's not really a battery if you think about it. It's a fuel system that I can add more energy to it, and it's really seamless and everything integrates. And that's what's really key about a number of our really important patents that we've, that we've acquired over time, is to be able to have an integrated DC bus system with multi-voltage, communications, and everything like that. But this presentation talks about innovation and disruption. And so when we think about the electric vehicle space, what's really taken place over time, going back through a few of the things that have already taken place, like James and I's first example with R2EV and some of the others, but we first want to touch on the difference between innovation, disruptive, and disruptive innovation. We all remember when Netflix first came out, that was a disruption that took place because the USPS system came up with a low cost way to ship CD-ROMs and DVDs. So by being able to do that, they enabled this new company, Netflix, to send at a very low cost rate their DVDs to all of us at home. We could go online, we could say, hey, I want this movie, I want these set of movies, when they're available, send them to me. So when we think about that, that consumer experience was, I want a movie, I don't want to go to Blockbuster, a very specific place to go and get that movie. I want it delivered to me and I can expect that I'll get these over some period of time. Well, they were disrupted by Redbox for a period of time where you're going to the grocery store, you're going to a convenience store, it's there for you already. And just in passing, you can get it and you don't have to wait as long. Well, now we all know the story of how that ended, and now we have the streaming wars going on, but that's still that same consumer experience. And it's really important to think about the consumer experience there. If I, if I want something, I want, it near, I, I want it as soon as possible. When I have that desire to consume the thing, I now want it. So the faster that I can deliver that as a service to the customer, the better off I am, the better the business is. And so Netflix first started with their streaming service, and now we have all sorts of streaming services across, but that's the inevitable evolution of disruption. When we think about what happened between taxis and rideshare services, that was an innovation. And the innovation requirement that was different from a disruption was having access to a mobile device that allowed you to know where you were, request a ride, send a driver to you, and that whole entire process was enabled because of an innovation of a mobile cell phone device that, that you could then on demand, again, on demand is the key thing, you could say, I want this thing, bring it to me. So ride sharing services disrupted, so this was a disruption and an innovation in that space, but it was because of another enabling technology. But what's gonna happen to gas stations? What are they going to do? So as it turns out, the way that gas stations are set up, you have a fuel company that provides that fuel service, and then you have the convenience store brand that's associated with it. Sometimes those are married together, but in the most case, the majority of the cases, they're not married together. So the convenience store operator and the, fuels, the fuel provider are not necessarily the same company, but they work together and they deliver the service. The convenience store operator, they make money selling Cheetos and beer. They make very little profit by maintaining the gasoline that's on that side of the service. The convenience store operators oftentimes are smaller mom and pop shops with one or two operations that they run, but they can also be larger, larger companies as well with several hundred institutions operating around them. Those are big businesses just as big of a business as the big giant brands that provide us uh, combustible fuel sources today. So here are two, two major market players that are looking to be disrupted. 
because there's no there's no need for a gas station if we have an electric vehicle and the convenience store now doesn't have a draw to bring their customers in to sell them the Cheetos and beer that they make their money. So we're going to have a little bit of a market shakeup. And what we think we can do is be able to provide a similar consumer experience, place it on these properties and be able to not put strain on our grid and things like this. So today, the answer to be able to provide uh, electric vehicle transportation is either with energy storage or transmission. And so those are really the only two things that we have as an answer to be able to give us the electrification that we're all driving towards today. So when we think about energy storage, we can get that from a variety of different sources. We can either get that um, at a discrete location where we're able to bring in the energy exactly at the same time that we need it. That's maybe if you own a home, and you have solar panels attached to it, maybe those solar panels directly charge your vehicle. But if you start to think about that, maybe that doesn't really work out as well. And you think, okay, there's probably a disconnect here. And then if you think about transmission, well, if everybody's driving home and getting home at the same time or driving to work and getting at work at the same time, where's all that extra energy going to come from? So let's take a minute and let's think about who our customer is. And there's a couple of different types of customer segments. So if we think about the consumer, the daily average driving consumer today has about 39 miles per day of driving. Some of us drive more, some of us drive less, but 39 miles. So if you think as an automotive manufacturer, if I give you 39 miles, that's the average. I've got to give you more than that to have a, a reasonable consumer experience. But right now as an industry, we're building that towards 300. And at the conference, the numbers that they're describing, they want 400 miles of electric drive range. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Then if we think about long haul, that was not even discussed at the battery show. There was not really a solution that was provided for long haul range trucks. So these are trucks that will need hundreds of kilowatt hours to be able to move their goods across the United States, across the world. And those are doing 600 to 650 miles on average a day. If you have two drivers in your cab, you can nearly double that. So that's a huge amount of power and we have to be able to figure out how to deliver that. No solutions were proposed at all at the show. Then if we think about local delivery, as more and more frequently we're ordering DoorDash and we're doing a variety of other things, these local delivery drivers are doing 40 to 125 miles a day. So if I'm Amazon and I've just ordered a fleet of 10,000 of these electric vehicles and I've designed it for 300 miles of range, I've overbuilt it for a majority of my vehicles and then overbuilt it for over half of them. So there's a disconnect between the way that we're designing these vehicles today and the way that we're using them as consumers, whether it's a, a daily driver, whether it's a long haul truck, which we don't have any answers for coming out of the conference, or local delivery vehicles. So we propose, all right, let's put chargers everywhere. We've got chargers everywhere, we'll have access. Whenever you have a few minutes, you plug into a charger. This seems like terrible technology waste to me. And that's what we're driving towards right now. So I'm attending the Department of Energy Conference to be able to uh, look at how we're going to spend these billions of dollars for electric vehicle infrastructure. And this is one of the solutions that we're all going to propose. I, I just don't wanna see the technology waste all over. I, I, I don't want to envision this. And a, and a majority of the experiences that we've seen with electric vehicles is, a lot of these things don't work or they're under repair or maybe they're occupied. So the solution can't be just putting chargers everywhere. Ubiquity sounds like a really terrible solution. And then the, the other problem associated with this is the famous duck curve. So the way we produce renewable energy from solar is, uh, and, and the demand curve that we consume that energy creates this really low trough right in the middle of the day. So we're overproducing our renewable energy and we can't use it because there isn't enough demand. So again, they say, all right, well, the answer is we put chargers at all of our work locations, and then that way we're able to soak up some of this energy. That's a very, very expensive proposition. And again, if we're only driving an average of 39 miles a day, that's a really small segment of energy. It's probably not a good use of that technology because it's very expensive. Race to ubiquity technology waste and a supply and demand imbalance creates a fantastic opportunity for jewel case to disrupt this industry. 
So really, when we think about it, what it comes down to is we've moved from one oil cartel to now a utility cartel. If I'm looking to electrify my gas station today with charging infrastructure, I need to go and acquire a whole entire new line. I need to bring down a giant transformer. Maybe that's 40 or $50,000. So I'm paying my utility 40 or $50,000 to be able to even provide this service. Then I need to go pay for a very expensive uh, piece of charging infrastructure, typically a level three charger. And that's going to cost another $80,000. And then where I am, uh, Idaho Power is a service provider. If I'm, if I'm adding a new line in that same category, it's $1,000 a month to be able to provide that service. Travis, there just absolutely isn't a way to be able to economically provide that to a customer and not charge them $100 for a fill-up. So we, we didn't do it. If that's our solution to all of this, where cars are more expensive, the fill-up is more expensive, we have low transmission line availability, I don't think we did it. There's a promise for electric vehicles, and we hope to deliver that. So if we look back at the past, some of the things that have been attempted before, uh, when James and I first started R2EV in 2006, seven, uh, there was another competitor in this space. It was called Project Better Place. So Project Better Place had this concept of a, of a massive single battery for all cars and you would drive through and the system would pull that battery out and replace it with a full one. Really great concept, but when you think about the way that we design cars today, that didn't work out quite, quite that way. Cars come in all shapes and sizes, lengths, cars and trucks are different, and, and this company refused to come up with a different solution for it. So they were able to raise somewhere in the, in the well, they raised a substantial amount of capital they're not around anymore because of that. So again, the modularity is a really important part about designing for, for a vehicle infrastructure. So when you think about that modularity, now I can have a couple for a moped or a scooter, a couple of more for a larger car. But our, our proposal now is to change that in a way so that you have a traction battery system and then you have a range extension battery system. And back in 2010, we were able to get a contract with a uh, tier one auto integrator for Fiat's. And this is a Fiat Panda, not a very attractive vehicle, but a Fiat Panda is a great taxi vehicle. So the Spanish government said, we're going to mandate electric taxis in our four major municipalities. And they all need to be electric and they need to have a modular removable battery system. So the tier one auto integrator selected us at the time, R2EV. We went over, we provided all this solution and it was to be able to replace those battery systems. So they ended up taking the design that you see here and they moved the motor back to where the batteries were initially pictured and then moved the battery set up to the front where the motor is. So you could go and replace those systems and extend your drive range. So perfect solution, but maybe we remember that in 2010, Portugal, Ireland, Greece, and Spain all went bankrupt. And so that voided that contract. So we're back, we're back to do it again, and we're doing it with a better design and a better solution. And again, this comes down to consumer behavior. When I want to get that DVD, when I want to watch that movie, I want to watch it exactly at the time that I want to consume that. I, I've decided that I want this, I want to consume it right now. We've trained the consumer that a vehicle gets its energy at a certain location. Now, the disruption with electric vehicles is you don't always have to do that, but we've already trained the consumer behavior that I go to a gas station to get that energy. So we can move them to an energy station to get more energy, whether it's level three charging with our big MESS patented system, or whether it's range extension with our Sigma based system. So we think this is a fantastic solution to both of these things. We think we can get uh, adoption with the auto industry with Sigma, but we have today our modular energy storage system that we can bring to those gas stations. So they're not paying for expensive transformers. They're not paying for expensive chargers. We can do direct battery to battery charging. We can get that from renewable energy sources and we deliver a consumer experience that they already know and understand. There's no reason to try to change consumer behavior if we can fit within it because we've already trained the consumer on what to do. And here it is. 
So from fuel to energy, when we imagine what we're being able to deliver to that, that customer, we can do large systems. So we can do buses, we can do that long haul freight, we can do local delivery, we can do small local delivery, consumer vehicles, on down to your on down to your moped and what we think the future really can be is range extension systems there's no faster way to increase energy into a system than to just bring that module to it we can do it with renewables we can do it quickly and that's what jewel case brings so range extension with our portables that's the sigma line that we're bringing out that's designed with uh with, with help of dave demuro so we were able to to develop that system and bring it forward we're looking to bring that forward with the next this next round of funding to uh to bring that product to market we're done with a majority of the internals so we're we're right there and then our new uh our new set of patents around the modular energy storage system that brings now a a semi-motive low um, low speed drive to events that we have with Insomniac. And this also now electrifies gas stations. So utility scale backup can be delivered portably, efficiently with renewable energy. Travis, I think we've done it. So that's the answer that we were able to bring to the battery show at Detroit last week. And it was very well received. Um, I had a couple of great conversations with some of the heads of uh, the major automakers that were there, um, fingers crossed, we'll be able to deliver something out to them. So again, when I went there, it wasn't, we're going to take this over entirely. This is a, we need to build this together. We're all in this together. We think we have a great, fantastic architecture and we're trying to bring that to the industry so that we can solve the problems that we didn't have any answers to until we showed up. Holy cow, Alex, that is, you know, I was prepared for a little bit of that, but not quite that full presentation. I am so excited to see how Jewel Case is plugging in and seeing the way forward for electric vehicles. And I really like that opportunity that, um, and when you think about how many gas stations around the country, and I don't even know what the number is, it's, it's got to be tremendous, right? There's there's at least 20 within five miles of where I live. Um, that's real estate. That's established you know, real estate, established locations, um, always in major areas. And it would be silly to think those are just going to disappear, right? And so the need to have people come back and continue that process, the need to uh, continue the mileage of electric vehicles, it all really plugged right in. Um, and it really made sense to me. Uh, so I'm excited to see how that's going. Yeah, thank you, Travis. We're, we're looking to bring um, the first set of, of modular energy storage systems out um, just right at the beginning of the new year. So we're working on those right now. Um, we've developed out a, a couple of the first set of racking systems for it. And again, that's serving on this letter of intent with Insomniac that's they need $100 million worth of these things, and they're going to be sitting around. So we might as well do something pretty cool with them, right? That's right. And you're really at the forefront of the technology itself, right? It's not just uh, a vision there. You have the solution. You have built it. You've been working on this for years. You have the the, the thoroughbred team uh, making it all happen. Um, it's, it's not pie in the sky. You have customers that are using technology and uh, you're going after this new, this whole new market, which is um, huge. This is just a huge, huge infrastructure play. We're going to be building out this infrastructure for temporary power systems. And so we're going to be able to compete in immediately and at a lower cost rate without having any trenching of new lines um, that's very expensive on a, on a particular piece of, of real estate. We're able to deliver our mobile solutions immediately. And we already have, have those systems that are paid for by uh, the temporary power that we're providing for events and, and things like that. So it's, it's, it's a win-win all around. I think what's really powerful as a position for Jewel Case is that you have high profile clients already using your technology, which allows you to get into the door everywhere else uh, much easier um, than had you not already been there. So congratulations on that as well. Um, any any final thoughts on how the battery show went or the next steps for Jewel Case for everybody before we wrap this up? Um, we have a number of fantastic announcements. Uh, you alluded to some of those with the, the food truck sales um that are going through um the contacts at the battery show have won us a uh i want to say a feather in the cap and we will be providing solutions for a number of these electric vehicle road shows that are going around today the answer is they're going to be powering these vehicles with generators until they saw us 
<laughs> yes, I have heard of a few big names that uh, the card drop offs and, and upcoming meetings uh, with some of these big guys. So we'll, we'll just leave it at that for now. But um, I do want to thank you for taking the time to share this with everybody. I know it's a very hectic schedule, a very hectic week for you. Um, for all the investors out there or potential investors, you know, Jewel Case loves to connect and respond to any questions. So if you have any follow on questions or ideas or just want to say hello, feel free to comment below. Um, they'll get back to you right away, as they always do. Um, thanks again, Alex. I hope you have a wonderful trip and we appreciate you. Thank you, Travis. Thank you, Power Pack. And, uh, and we're here to solve some big problems. <laughs>